Okay, I'm now at part two of um, this third lecture on Haldeman, which is called uh, the Techno Science Machine, or I call it Techno Science. Okay, little pun there. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, <clears throat> and we've been looking. I have been looking, and we have been looking at the invasions that medicine can make. Um, <clears throat> but the connections. What I want you to do is make connections between these invasions and the self because they you cannot mess with the body without picking up the self as well it's sort of like putting a needle into something and um, expecting to get you know one layer of fabric and getting two it's like you're you're going to necessarily get you know you go and stitch into the the body you're going to pick up the self as well and on 171 um this is what uh Mandela is coming to grips with the idea that he's actually going to have um, another, a new limb, which is actually going to be stronger than his other limbs. Um, instead of, because when, this is the issue of sort of the trick of the book, which is time travel, that effectively um, they're, because they're going back and forth in relative time, because they're traveling in near light, you know, towards light speeds, fractions of the speed of light, but they're getting there, um, that there is a shift in time so that they can appear out of the enemy's future or past and so on. Or their own futures or past, which is what will separate, that's ultimately what will, uh, they feel, kill the relationship between the two people, which is the only thing that really in the end is real. And the rest of it is absolute, it's just garbage. Um, Although the creation of the second couple to be, um, Charlie and Diana, um, is the the creation of the bigger world outside the um, nuclear cup, the nuclear pair of uh, Mandela and Potter. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> Mandela says, "You mean I can just think move and the thing moves?" Of course you can. He looked at me quizzically and went back to his adjustments. What a wonder. Prosthetics sure has come a long way. Prosthetics? You know, artificial. Oh, yeah, like in books, like wooden legs and hooks and stuff. How would he ever get a job? <laughs> so this is quite funny, right? On 171, where he's like, what? what the hell? You know, it's like this is supposed to be sort of this forbidden topic. You don't talk about that. But uh, they don't do prosthetics anymore. They do replacements. Um, this is no prosthesis. This is the this is better, you know, than the original. Um, and this, is, with the, the issue about this, and Haldeman has written about this kind of, these politics essentially of what happens to the body and who owns it and, uh, uh, extensively. Because if you think about these, at the moment we've got, we have had people returning from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan with lost legs, of course, um, which is very common because of the blasts come from below, right? And it's the, because the likelihood is that the way you're going to get hurt is you're going to, their Jeep, pardon me, your Humvee or your MRAP or whatever it is, is going to roll over some kind of explosive that's hidden and uh, blow you up and you're going to lose a leg. Uh, so what they're replacing these legs with now is um, you'll see some, uh, this, this, this standard sort of thing, you've got a, you've got a stump essentially uh, say above, above the knee and above the knee um, amputation and then so you've got to make a sort of um, socket for that to go into and then on the, out of the bottom of that is a will come a titanium pen with a foot on it. The difference is that these uh, feet can actually register and have their own balance systems so the initial prostheses uh, that the United States was, was producing and, and supplying the soldiers with in the early 2000s were of the order of $100,000 pieces of equipment um, because they had motion detectors and they had pressure sensors in them and they had computers in them and they had to be tuned up and they had to be upgraded. And, you know, they, and these are, in other words, they're, they're, they are very complex few things are more complex than trying to replace something like a foot um, which is an enormously complex piece of design and engineering um, on behalf of thousands of years of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution 
So um, that's what you got to replace. Um, the question is, if so, let's say the country decides that it wants to go to war again, and it calls up people like you who uh, you know have a have lost a leg, but they they figure, yeah, you know, you can you'll be okay on the battlefield. And you say, well, I don't really want to go. And they're like, okay, we want our leg back. Are you ready for that? Now, there's an interesting book by Gavin Smith, who's a British science fiction writer, called Veteran, um, where this is exactly how things work, where the, the veteran of the, the, pon of the title, the eponymous uh, veteran, um, has all kinds of enhancements. Um, basically, he's got guns that pop out of his shoulders, and he's got all kinds of um, neural enhancements, and he can tap into uh, satellite feeds, and he can get all kinds. Well, when he is no longer a veteran, the government takes all that stuff away. It takes away his prosthetics, it takes away his, uh, his connections, and he's just not a person anymore as far as he's concerned. And so he accepts a job, this is the idea of the novel, working for the government again because he wants his stuff back, because it's integral to who he, who he is. Um, so now I'm quoting to you from uh, an article in, uh, from a website, which was militarymedicaltechnology.com, <clears throat> and it was uh, published in 2006, oh, no, pardon me, it was published in 2005, uh, called Revolutionizing Prosthetics. War has been a friend of the science and technology of prosthetics, said Tom Guth, chief prosthetist at the RGP Prosthetic Research Center in San Diego. Summing up the historical and current relationship among prosthetics, the private sector, and the military. Yeah, well, no kidding. Um, so the again, we are at the sort of the, the issue of the the technology which you must have if you're going to survive now. I mean, it's increasingly, you know, if you're, if you want to survive longer than a couple of weeks um, and given the weapons you may face, you will probably have to have uh, complex technologies available to you. So here's another example from the ISN, the Institute for Solar Nanotechnology, if you have a look. We've been delivering Red Cross packages to villages in the area, but even this isn't safe. This afternoon, Dewey couldn't move fast enough when we heard the incoming. We saw he hadn't made it to cover. Shrapnel. Major arm wound. I didn't have to wonder long whether he was all right. Switched to monitor him. Knew they had the same picture back at command. Took his vitals. Heart misbehaving. Arrest. Something in that suit. The smarts to figure out what's wrong. Communicate it even do something about it all by applying little electrical currents to systems that are unimaginably small and light. By activating tiny molecular hinges chained together by the millions in the fabric of the uniform, it was able to start CPR until help arrived. Dewey, they say he'll be just fine. Tomorrow's soldier may have emergency medical care built right into the uniform using a mechanically active nanomaterial dubbed exomuscle. Professor Tim Swagger leads the ISN team. One of the things that science can do right now is monkey with the brain's chemistry. And um, this is something that uh, Haldeman points to on 164, where they now take pills at this point in the, in the war. They take pills so that they are not emotionally, they're not full of anxiety or, or you know they're not unable to, to function uh, and he says you know feeling all right all right she says took my pill yeah happy times um, and then he says uh, sack with me tonight if we're both here she said neutrally on 164 and this is um, you know just as scary as I think having the fear itself that this uh, essentially deadening you know getting into the brain and um, and tinkering with the brain chemistry uh, can be pretty scary stuff. Um, and then, of course, we move on to the th something like the brain machine interface, where we're, you know, we're, as I say, we're catching up to that on page 182. 
The, br the machine kept my body totally inert and zapped my brain with four millennia's worth of military facts and theories, and I couldn't forget any of it, not while I was in the tank. So Mandela is then, uh, becomes just a little part of the machine. You know, the body is sort of just this, like they just, you know, there's this concept of you sort of just have to, the, the the body starts to look like an, a sort of unfortunate byproduct of um, having an intelligence that you know it's like damn this stupid body that you got to carry with you, um, and that the state already completely owns. 